Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the 42nd World Travel Market London. While the travel and tourism sector has been subject to significant disruption over the past few years, returning here together at XL London is testament to the sector's resilience and strength. A post-pandemic world has revealed exciting new opportunities, trends and innovations, but it's also given us a once-in-a-lifetime chance to reconsider tourism and ask ourselves, how can we rebuild differently? What should the tourism sector of tomorrow look like? And of course, how can we prepare ourselves for the future? With that in mind, I have the greatest of pleasure introducing the opening keynote for World Travel Market London 2022, someone who can certainly help us make sense of the possibilities open to us in the future. Please join me in welcoming global futurist and strategist and CEO of Fast Future, Mr. Rohit Talwar. Thank you. Well, good morning and welcome to the show. And thank you for taking time out of this fantastic exhibition to come in and listen for a while and to explore ideas. And we will have a panel after I've spoken where we'll have some real experts talking about their vision of 2030 and beyond. And what I would encourage you to do is to make sure you ask them some questions. And uh, let's get going. Um, oh, we've lost the first slide. Uh, what I would say right at the beginning of this is that I'm going to talk about where we're going and some of the challenges, opportunities and risks on the horizon. Throughout this conference, there are going to be an, an incredible array of speakers talking about the trends, the developments, the forecasts with some great content. So we're going to push beyond that a little bit to think about the further horizon. And as soon as we start thinking about the longer term, two things happen. We have an emotional reaction to what we're hearing, and we have some logical objections. Those are perfectly valid, perfectly normal, perfectly human reactions, and perfectly useless. Because whatever you see or feel or are concerned about, it won't stop Etihad launching an NFT. It won't stop Turkish, uh, the Turkish airports developing a presence in the metaverse. It won't stop hotels accepting crypto. It won't stop Saudi's ambitions for being a leading tourism destination. So my challenge to you and my encouragement to you is over the next hour and a half or so, give yourselves permission to just listen to what people are saying, to think about it, and to Think about how you might go deeper in understanding what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what it could mean for you. You've always got time to bring back the emotional and logical objections. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover four things. We're going to talk in about 20 minutes that I've got left. We're going to talk a little bit about the context in which we're looking at the future. We'll talk a little bit about what that could mean for the kind of business strategies and markets we might go after. We'll talk about what this could mean around new business models. And then we'll talk about, well, what can we do about this? How can we take this forward in a very practical way? And I think right now, what we see is that we're faced by a whole set of uncertainties. Everything around us we see from economics to geopolitics to the climate issues, there's just uncertainty. And in a sense, some of the things that we're also seeing are truly unbelievable. If I'd spoken to you on January or even December 1st, 2019, and told you that the travel industry would be shut down by March, you would have all thought that was unbelievable. But we're also, the developments we see coming with technology are also unbelievable in what they're already enabling. We also know that we don't know what's coming. It's almost impossible to know what might be coming. Uh, and so everything we've known, all the standard routines we have for responding to change may not work. We don't know because we don't know what's coming. We also know that um, it, some of these things are unthinkable. Some of them just sound terrible. Or they sound like, I didn't sign up for that. That wasn't the world I came into. And finally, we're beginning to understand that we can't control most of this. The stuff that's happening around us is, is uncontrollable. And so what that means is, 
we, as much as learning about what's coming, we also need to start unlearning the stuff that served us in the past. Because our old routines, our old ways of thinking, planning, strategizing, going after markets may not work anymore. And, and the first thing I would say is, if we look at those risks, everything we talk about is a challenge, but there's also an opportunity in there. So when we think about climate change, we have world leaders today meeting in Sharm el Sheikh at COP27. The UN has now warned us that we're getting to a tipping point. What we're seeing now is more and more organizations breathing a sigh of relief and saying, OK, we don't have to pretend that we might get there by 2030. Let's think about what would happen if we don't. What's our response now? And executives across organizations saying, thank God, we can actually talk about this stuff and talk about our scenarios and strategies for if we don't get there. Because we know we're in an industry that's hugely exposed. Even though we're not top of the list in terms of carbon emission, in terms of energy consumption, in terms of sustainability impact, we're an easy target. We're going to get hit first. We know that. So we have to start thinking about, well, what would we do? And, and how do we start thinking about what would happen and what our response would be? We also know that we're, in the, we're sitting in a massive economic storm. Countries like the UK going into a recession that the Bank of England says could last two years. Rampant inflation, all sorts of economic challenges. And again, we could sit there and just panic and say, wow, I don't want to talk about this stuff. Or you say, great. Let's acknowledge this and now think, think about, if this might happen, what strategies and markets would we pursue? Because we need to do some things differently. And finally, we know things like automation is going to drive people out of their jobs. We know that the pace of change means that a lot of industries are talking about taking out 20, 40, 50% of their headcount in the next few years through AI and automation. That is going to have an impact on us. Because before those people get new jobs, their incomes are going to go down. So their willingness to travel might be affected. Again, we need to not hide that and hope it doesn't happen. We need to say, well, what can we do about that? What new business models, what new pricing strategies can we go after? So let's start to talk about some of those things. What are those things that we can start to think about? Where might the money be? Well, the first is a very simple model that we're starting to see people embrace that is going back 200 years to the idea of a savings club. We've already seen it in some cases where I go to do my shopping, I pay £27.50 for my grocery shopping, I can top that up by £2.50 and just have that money automatically directed to some sort of savings scheme. All of this can be done automatically, and for the travel industry, this represents a phenomenal opportunity to start to say, Let's partner with the providers who provide the technology platforms so we can lock customers in early. So even a year before they want to travel, they can say, I want to buy a holiday from you, or a flight, or a hotel stay, and let me lock in now. You give me a discount for doing it, and I'll maybe pay off 20% through the savings scheme over uh, the course of the year, and then pay the final amount at the end. But you lock them in. We're starting. And, People say, well, why would I do that? And I, my view is, well, you know you discount in the last couple of months. So why not bring that discount forward but lock people in so you've got a much stronger hold on capacity? We're also seeing a growing understanding that we shouldn't treat crypto any differently to accepting euros, to accepting yen, to accepting rupees. You wouldn't hesitate to accept them. So why would you treat crypto any differently? The players like Visa, MasterCard, Stripe, all of those players are now allowing you to accept crypto and they convert it for you instantly into your base currency. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, over 350 million people around the world hold crypto now. Over 25% of US travelers want to pay in crypto. We now have a growing number of people who are being paid in crypto. They're working in that world and they naturally want to spend it. So why wouldn't we go there? And we're seeing this being responded to by the industry. So we're seeing people like Expedia and many other travel agencies accepting a growing range of crypto payments using Travala as the base platform or, or other platforms. We're seeing hotels getting in on the act. This is a hotel in Switzerland, the Dolder Grand. 
was the first to accept crypto. A great brand advantage for them, being the first mover. The amount of PR they got for this was incredible. Still, if you're a hotel that accepts crypto, you get PR value. But more importantly, you're opening themselves up to a customer base who might not otherwise have come to you. We're seeing airlines doing this. More and more airlines, Air Baltic were one of the first, lot, various others, uh, and, and you're seeing a lot of different travel agents behind that providing the ability for players in the field to accept crypto. Brisbane Airport was the first airport to accept crypto. But some of you are from destinations, and we know a lot of destinations are challenged in this environment to find the investment to keep their destination moving forward. So one of the developments last year that really caught my eye was Miami. They launched their own cryptocurrency called the Miami coin. And the great thing here was that every time you do a transaction with crypto, there's a tiny fee charged, and that's used to pay what are called the miners, the people who validate the transactions and record them. They take 30% of that fee. In the first week alone, they took a million dollars as a city, which they're investing in infrastructure, in tourism development, in facilities development. Now, how many of you wouldn't want to have pretty much free money coming in to help develop your destination? So there's some powerful opportunities there. And then one of the really interesting things I see happening now is people beginning to realize that in times of economic difficulty, we start to think about our assets differently. So if you think about it, I have a collection of Chelsea programs. I'm a Chelsea fan. So I want a period of mourning for how badly we played yesterday. In fact, if anyone was watching, you would have wondered if Chelsea were on the pitch. Uh, they were just staying in the dressing room, keeping their clothes dry. But my, my collection of Chelsea programs is worth something. Someone is willing to pay for that. I can get money for that and go and buy travel with it. Uh, if you have a parking space outside your house, now there are people who will rent that out for you on your behalf and get you a constant stream of money. If you have any kind of store, a loyalty card, you know you can convert that into savings with that store. And then now, if you have trees in your garden, you can turn them into money. Why? Because we know about carbon offset schemes, where someone who's a carbon emitter buys a carbon offset that's effectively paying for trees somewhere else that will absorb that carbon. The problem has been that it's very hard to monitor. So we know in the Amazon, for example, the trees in the Amazon now emit more carbon than they absorb. So we're having to change that. And what's happening now is people are putting sensors on those trees to monitor the carbon emissions. Then they're putting that information onto a blockchain, which means it's super secure, super transparent. You can monitor it. And then all of those are locked into something, a digital certificate called an NFT. So you, your ownership is very clear. That means we can monitor it precisely how much carbon those trees have absorbed. Which means that you can now put the trees in your garden or the trees in your town or city into a carbon exchange scheme or a carbon offset scheme and start making money for them, from them. So everything we have is monetizable. All it requires are the platforms the tools to say, let me put that in as a way of paying. And this takes a little bit of thinking, but what we're going to see in the next couple of years is players emerge in the space who will do this for you. I'll give them my programs, uh, and I'll say, yeah, I want to take a flight with, uh, let me pick an airline, Virgin Airlines, uh, and you can sell my programs. You'll sell them maybe a month before I travel to guarantee. The money will transfer. My digital certificate of ownership will transfer. And then the physical goods will transfer. Once all three of those happen, and it's all recorded digitally, then the money is re released to the airline. We're starting to make it possible to accept almost anything as a payment. This is our challenge, is to unlearn the view that says the only way you can buy travel is with cash and to start to say, if you have assets, they're worth cash, how do we tap into that in tough times when we need to think about new revenue streams, new ways of helping people pay for travel? 
We all, let, now when we start to think about, well, what about the strategies we might pursue? What about the markets we go after? Well, one of the things we know is that only, well, somewhere between 60 and 70% of the people on this planet will never get on a plane, will never come to your destination, will never come to your property. Now, you might be OK with that. But for me, that smells like a massive opportunity. How do I take my experience and give it to them in a different way? How do I reach that audience? Because in the pandemic, most of us didn't have a business. So what do we do? Do we sit and wait for things to open? Or do we say, we've just been through a very, very expensive training course, a very expensive rehearsal for what could happen again? It doesn't matter why, but we could see things happen that lead to a dramatic drop in travel or a change in pa travel patterns? How do we protect ourselves against that? How do we make sure it doesn't impact us in the same way? Well, it's about finding new markets. So what are some of the things we can do? Well, one example of this. Let's go backwards. There you go. One example of what we can do is what Etihad did. To celebrate their 20th anniversary, they launched what are called NFTs. We don't have to know how they work, but these are basically digital collectibles. So you might collect porcelain figurines, football cards, photographs of celebrities. They all have monetary value. They're collectibles. Well, now with NFTs, we're creating digital versions of that. And the great thing is that if you have a digital version, you can display it and look at it all the time. If you have a rare collectible that's physical, you might not want to show it to anyone in case it gets stolen. But the really interesting thing about these collectibles is that they give people a stream of additional benefits. So this one costs $349. You could get silver tier status. You could get a range of additional benefits. The fascinating thing was that less than 20% of the people who bought these NFTs had ever flown with Etihad. Less than 50% had ever got on a plane before. This is taking loyalty to the next level. It's about building a new relationship with customers. It's about really connecting with people that in a way that you can't with your loyalty scheme. It's developing a deep and personalized relationship that allows you to increase what you offer them, increase what they might buy from you, increase their connection with you, increase the feedback they give you about your proposition, and tell you what they might buy from you without getting on one of your planes, coming to one of your hotels, or visiting your destinations. Because they trust you, because you get them, they might make you a gateway to their purchasing. How might we do that? Well, the metaverse is one opportunity. We're seeing a growing number of people understand that the metaverse is a way of reaching people who we might never serve or we don't understand today, or creating a digital version of our physical experience for a new audience. Now, you might say, well, why do I want to do this? But remember what I said at the beginning. You personally may never visit a metaverse. That doesn't matter. There are people who are, and there are people in your organization who understand this. And if they can design experiences that create that opportunity, why wouldn't we think about it? And we're seeing people like Tur the Turkish airports, Istanbul airport, creating a metaverse presence. Uh, and we're seeing lots of players in the industry saying, yeah, let's do something there. Because we can create a retail experience. We can take all of the people that we sell through as an airline, all the people that have a retail presence in our airport, we can put them all into a metaverse presence and start to generate new propositions. And we've got our loyalty scheme to encourage people to go and have a look. But one of the reasons why people are getting so excited about this is the scale of the audience you can re reach. Last year, Ariana Grande, and I don't know how many of you are fans, it doesn't really matter, she held a concert over two days in a metaverse called Fortnite. And just, just to help you understand, right, metaverses, the simplest way of thinking about them is they're like digital versions of Disneyland. You can go and experience all sorts of th things in the digital realm. The difference is, in some of these metaverses, you can buy land and you can build your own experience there in a digital form. It's the easiest way of thinking about it. In this case, 78 million people 
came to Ariana Grande's concert over two days. But it was more than her just performing. It was all sorts of experiences. For them, it was fantastic because they raised over $20 million in, in revenue in selling the artifacts, her clothes, her earrings, all sorts of digital elements of that experience. Now, you might think, well, why would I do this? Why do people pay more for Gucci sneakers online than the physical version? It's because people are paying more for them. That's it. You know, why do people pay $60,000 for a watch? when you can buy something just as good for 10,000. Because you can. So there's a whole generation that are growing up as gamers, hundreds of millions of people who are in those worlds, who are buying and selling goods, who understand the economics of their world. If you want to understand how, how metaverse works, go find a 14 to 16 year old. The reason I say a 14 to 16 year old, they speak a little bit slower than the 10 to 12 year olds who really get it. Right? So go find someone who will explain this to, stuff to you. Again, set aside the emotions and the logical objections. Just get your head around it. What is it? How does it work? Why are people spending money there? And then look at what others are doing. And we're seeing great experiences being created. Hyundai, get that. Uh, there's a generation coming through who might never buy a car. How do we get them interested in cars? Well, we create a, a theme park experience in a metaverse where you can test drive cars, you can design your own car, you build a brand experience with Hyundai without ever giving you any money, because then you're locked into my brain as a kid that I could be your partner in the future. We've seen people in the travel industry go there. Helsinki's created a virtual experience for people around the world to participate in. Seoul, when the, the pandemic locked the world down, they created a digital version of their city for two reasons. One was to let the citizens access uh, all the services of the city when they couldn't come out. But the other was to show off Seoul to the world. The Korean government is putting like something like $250 million behind creating a digital career in the metaverse so people around the world can experience the best of Korea whether or not they can travel. There's a woman here waving. I hope you're not waving at me because I'm not paying attention. I'm sorry. Afterwards, we'll talk. And I talked earlier about having multi-asset accounts. It's starting to happen. These guys, Zelf, claim to be the first bank of the metaverse. So in their account, you can put your cash. You can put your NFTs that you've purchased. You can put your other cryptocurrencies. And you can put the rewards you've earned in games. So if you play games and you make money or you sell goods, this is just the start. My programs, my parking space, everything can go into this account. This is mind-blowing, because when you want to then travel, pay for a flight ticket or a hotel stay or a visit to an experience, you just convert some of that to cash, you put it onto the Visa card, and you go and spend it as you would normally. That is mind-blowing. That is turning everything we have, even the clothes you're wearing, which can be sold second-hand, Literally everything you have becomes an asset that can be transferred into money. My question is, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you find a partner who's doing this? I'm not suggesting all of you do this, but there are partners out there who are going to make this happen. Why wouldn't you go for it? So, last few minutes, what can you do? Well, the first thing is once you've looked at this, you can bring the emotional reactions back and the intellectual objections back and go, I don't need any of this. I'm really happy with our business. I'm really happy with how much money we're making. And I'm willing to back my salary and telling our executive board that we're sorted to 2030 and beyond. Or you can start to say, well, maybe we need to do some different things. Maybe the first thing we need to do is to start that unlearning process by working with our leaders to evolve their mindset, to evolve their thinking into some of the stuff I've been talking about. And I've gone through this really fast. We'll talk more about it in the session at 2 o'clock. But it's also then looking at our leadership programs and asking the question, is how much are we training our leaders to bring disruptive thinking in? How much are we encouraging them to challenge? How much are we encouraging the next generation to bring us ideas? And it's about building deep digital literacy. 
there's a lot of technologies. You'll, when you get the slides, you'll see these. But a huge number of interesting technologies already out there, like AI, machine learning, Internet of Things, that are already changing our world. In the next few years, we're just going to see a massive explosion of these technologies that will truly blow our minds. Materials that can change their properties in a hotel, 3D and 4D printing for our, our properties, uh, genetic materials that will allow us to absorb carbon in the atmosphere, all sorts of fascinating things. But at the core of this is information technology. And if we are not getting our people to develop a nerd level digital literacy, then we're tying at least one hand behind our back. The next is to start to say, how do we evolve some sort of formal process of looking at what's changing both around us and what might be coming over the horizon? It doesn't have to be a big full blown process, but let's try to evolve something. And the first place we start is our built-in radar. We have people in our organizations. We have customers. We have partners. We have people in our networks. We have visitors who come on our planes, who come to our destination, who stay in our hotels. All of those are part of our radar on what they're seeing that's changing, what their family are doing that's different, what new jobs are their kids going into. We have a phenomenal radar there that's free. How do we tap it? How do we start those conversations and start encouraging people to bring those ideas to us? And then how do we start to use that information to build up some different scenarios of what might play out? Now, that's not about finding the scenario we like best and going for that. That's about saying, let's think about a range of possibilities from worst case to best case and think about how we would respond to any of them. Because some of the best stuff we've done with clients and some of the best scenarios we've seen are the ones which bring out really new ideas that we'll do anyway because they were worst case ideas, but actually we should be doing them now. In, they're an incredible release of ideas. And a big thing is our body language. Asking ourselves the, whether there's a difference between what we say about being a great culture that's innovative and open to ideas and welcoming challenge and welcoming out ideas from the outside and how we actually behave. So we talk about this, but it's our behavior like that. What happens when someone in your organization has a great idea? How easy is it for them to put that forward? How encouraging are we in them developing that idea? If someone says, well, I can see an opportunity to do something really interesting over here, how many of us say, great, go and develop that a little bit and bring it back to us. Help us understand what it is and how it might work. And how many of us give them 100 reasons why we can't do that now? Or say things like, well, that's a great idea for the future, but in the real world, well, right now, the real world is having that balance between going after today's revenues and markets and doing this more expansive and radical thinking about how we secure our future. It's just as important. We've just been through a rehearsal of what happens when we don't do enough forward thinking. So my challenge to you is to look at that and to say, what can we do? One of the most fun things we do with our clients as well is we do a thought experiment that says, what if you were starting again tomorrow? You're a hotel, you're a destination, you're an attraction, a cruise line, an airline. What if you were starting again? How would you do that? What would your business look like? What's the key information you need to run your business? What are the key outcomes you want? What kind of technology do you then need to make that happen? And then you start to think about well, what kind of physical experience do we put on top of that? And where would we put the people? And that's kind of how all the digital and new startups are, are working. So giving ourselves the permission to think about that. We might not do it, but out of it might come some very powerful ideas about how we drive change. So I hope this has made some sense to you. I think that all of us are good dancers. We know how to dance when the market changes. There's a bit of a turn down. When a competitor loses, launches a new product that we don't have when there's an environmental issue that challenges us in our destination, when there are new regulatory requirements. We have a dance routine for all of those. But now everything is changing at the same time. The music is changing almost every second. We have no idea how to do the dance routines. 
Now, we can write a business plan and a strategy for how to dance, but I don't know anyone in the world who's learned how to dance with a business plan or through a strategy. The only way you learn how to dance is by getting on the dance floor, looking really ugly, tripping over your own feet, kicking other people, hoping that no one you know has noticed you, but eventually you start to dance, and you start to learn how to dance when the music changes. And you see who in your organization is really good at adapting to the dance music changing, and who it is that doesn't matter what the music is, they're still doing this dance. And they've been doing that dance for 60 years, and they're never going to change. And the question is, how well does that dance routine respond when the music's playing at 155 beats per minute? We have to give ourselves permission to learn new dance routines. OK, that's my time up. I hope that's made some sense. As I say, we're going to have a second session at 2 o'clock this afternoon. We're going to go into a bit deeper into how you can get your heads around this and do something with it.